I'm Kerry. I work as a trainer here at Unity. Um, I create written articles for the Unity Learn site. Hi, and I'm Matt Schell. I'm a trainer also at Unity, and I focus mainly on video tutorials, and I also stream on Twitch doing the live training sessions. So today, we're talking about performance optimization for beginners. This talk is for people who can make games using Unity, but don't really know where to start with performance. Um, maybe you're not from a computer science background before you started making games with Unity, or you're new to making games in general. By the end of this talk, you'll feel comfortable with the basics of performance optimization. You'll know some core concepts. You'll know some terminology. You'll know how to use one of Unity's built-in tools to measure your game's performance. And you'll know where to go next from there to get the help you need to get your game running quickly and smoothly. And so one thing I just want to emphasize at the start, you know, a lot of us may think of performance optimization as kind of a chore or a drag or something to kind of work through. Uh, I just want to offer that it can also be inc incredibly satisfying and gratifying, right? It's a way you can make your game objectively better. You know, if you can make your game run faster without sacrificing quality or gameplay, uh, it's just an incredible feeling. Before we kick off our talk properly, we just want to let you know about two other talks um, during Unite Europe that are by our colleagues at Unity on the topic of performance. There's a talk today at half past three, Practical Guide to Profiling Tools in Unity. That's by our colleague Valentin Simonov, and that's a hands-on guide to using the tools that we're going to show in this session um, with like tons of examples. It's pretty specific and detailed. If you enjoy learning about the concepts in this talk, you should definitely check out that one to see more of a hands-on version of it. And then tomorrow, um, there's an advanced performance talk by our colleague Ian Dundor at half past 12. That talk is for more advanced users who really want to push what they can do in Unity. But if you're interested in performance and you're enjoying learning about it, he super knows his stuff. And it will be fascinating, if maybe a little less practical if you're just starting out. So the question is, where do we start? So we frequently get asked, can't you just tell me how to reduce my draw calls or something? And the answer is no. Uh, performance problems are unique to every game. And this is a kind of concept that we really want to emphasize today. What has helped other people with their games won't necessarily help you, right? If you don't share the same problem or you're not sort of fighting for the same resources, you may actually make your performance worse by trying to implement a solution that worked for someone else. So we really want to kind of emphasize an empirical process of looking at data and making concrete improvements. So to that end, we strongly advise don't try to fix anything until you know what's wrong, right? If somebody says, oh, I reduced my draw calls and my game went this much faster, right? That may or may not help you, and it may actually cause more problems than it solves. Yeah, fixing performance problems involves actually understanding your problem and then making decisions based on that understanding. It's definitely not about going, oh, this one guy uses arrays instead of lists, so I should do that. Um, what we're going to teach you today is how to gather performance data, how to interpret it, and then how to make those decisions yourself, not just a recipe for like make your game run faster. So what should we be doing if these are things that we should not be doing? So every time your game has a problem, we need to profile, right? Profile our game, analyze the data that we gather through profiling, make some kind of change, attempt a solution, and then, importantly, profile the effects of that change, right? So we're trying to gather hard data that we can act on effectively. Before we get into that, though, we're going to sort of really go back to basics here and make sure that we all understand what we're measuring when we measure performance and what we're talking about when we talk about performance. 
So we're going to start with frame rate, because that's a pretty common measure of performance in games. So in games, a frame is like a frame in animation. It's a still image of our game drawn to the screen. Drawing a frame to the screen is called rendering a frame. And frame rate, or how fast frames are being rendered, is measured in frames per second. You're probably familiar with that term. Most modern games aim to achieve a frame rate of 60 frames per second, um, but a lot of the time, 30 frames per second is acceptable, particularly if it's a game that doesn't involve fast reactions like a puzzle game or an adventure game. At frame rates below 30, that's when graphics start to seem jerky or the controls can seem unresponsive. That's when people start to notice problems. But it's not just the speed that's important, it's consistency. Changes in frame rate are very noticeable to players. So we're not just aiming for a quick frame rate, we're aiming for a quick and stable frame rate. So we're just going to take a very quick look at what happens during a frame. Every time a frame is rendered, Unity performs a whole bunch of different tasks. At the most basic level, this is what happens. The central processing unit, the CPU, updates the game state. This means reading user input, executing scripts, performing calculations, and so on. Some core Unity engine stuff happens at this point, too, the stuff that keeps everything ticking over. Once the state has been updated, the CPU works out what's going to be drawn to the screen. Um, this includes things like working out what can currently be seen by a camera, where to draw the shadows, that sort of thing. The CPU then sends instructions about what to draw to the graphics processing unit, the GPU. And then finally, the GPU draws things according to those instructions. When all of these tasks are performed quickly enough, our game has a quick and acceptable frame rate. When any of these tasks aren't performed quickly enough, the frame takes too long to render, and the frame rate drops. So performance issues have two fundamental causes, right? The first is trying to do too much. This is fairly straightforward to understand, right? So even the most efficient system has a limit to how much it can do in a single frame. The second type of problem is caused by inefficiencies, which we'll also refer to as bottlenecks. When our game takes too long to render a frame because the CPU takes too long to perform its tasks, our game is what's known as CPU bound. When our game takes too long to render a frame because of operations on the GPU, we'll say that we're GPU bound, right? So we have these two kind of sets of resources, and we're trying to balance between the two of them and make sure we're not using too much on one side or the other. And this may be why one person's optimization may shift the balance in the wrong direction. It's really important to identify what kind of problem your game has, right, for this very reason. If your problem is that you're trying to simulate an ecosystem in great detail, you have hundreds of AI agents running around, let's say, this may be too much work for the CPU to handle in a single frame, and then it's really not going to be a productive use of your time trying to shave off draw calls or improve GPU performance, right? You're going to be barking up the wrong tree. Likewise, if your game is GPU bound, it's not going to help to reduce the number of physics optimizations or trying to be or physics operations or trying to be optimizing your AI code. So we've said what you need to do every time is profile, analyze, make a change, and then repeat that process. Let's talk about how you actually do this. We'll start with how you profile. So profiling is the name for the process of measuring aspects of our game's performance at runtime. Unity has a few built-in profiling tools. Today, we're just looking at one. This is the profiler window. Uh, you can open this in Unity using the top menu bar. You just go to Window Profiler. It brings this thing up. On the left-hand side of it, you'll see a column. Um, of what are called profilers. Um, and each profiler displays information about a single aspect of our game, like CPU usage or audio. 
the top part of the profiler window where you can see those graphs. That shows data from each profiler over time. Um, it's important to look at profiling data over time because some problems may be constant. Some may appear for a single frame known as spikes. Um, and other problems may get gradually better or worse as, as our game plays. There is a ton of information in the profiler, but don't be put off by that complexity. You normally only look at data from one area at a time. You can ignore or even turn off the rest of it. So you use the profiler to gather data when your game is running. You can do this when your game's running in the Unity editor, or you can do that on a build of your game. Under most circumstances, you should be doing that with a build. There are two reasons for that. Um, firstly, when the profiler runs in the editor, it actually includes some data from the Unity editor, so the numbers you see aren't as accurate. The second reason is, and this is sort of a good rule of thumb for profiling in general, you should profile in as close to real life circumstances as possible. So if you're making a mobile game, profile it on a mobile device rather than your high-end development PC, because you may have problems on a mobile GPU that you're not seeing on your decent computer. Yeah, so how do we analyze this data, right? We have a bunch of data here. One key concept that I'd like you all to take away is the idea of kind of allocating a budget per frame, right? So if we're targeting 60 frames per second, we're looking at around 16 milliseconds per frame. If we're targeting 30 frames per second, we have around 33. So importantly, we can select an individual frame, right? And we can see here sort of these horizontal lines showing what frame rate we're hitting. And we can select a problem frame, and we can gather data about what is happening in that frame, right? So if we're CPU bound, we can't, oh, sorry. So we can compare the CPU and GPU profilers to see where the most time is being spent. If it's the GPU, we know we have a problem with rendering and we're GPU bound. Um, and that's enough for us to get started, right? Then we can dig into, OK, what is the problem with our rendering, right? If we're CPU bound, we need to find out a little bit more. And the CPU profiler graph is color coded so that we can identify which systems are taking up time during the frame. For example, rendering. We then use the detailed information at the bottom area that you can see part of here to dig into the problem. So for example, you can select functions by time, which is highlighted here, um, and we can sort, right? So we can see which function is taking the most time, which is the second most, and we can kind of home in on where the top level problems are. So, now that we know, for example, that we're CPU bound, we can look at what broad area our problem is, and that's enough to get us started on the next step. OK, so we've profiled, we've analyzed the data. Now we need to make some changes to try and fix our problem. How do we know where to start? I think this is the part where people get a bit intimidated sometimes and think, you maybe need to know a lot. You really don't. Um, your, your analysis is where you start from. So you know that you have a CPU problem, and you know that it's physics, and you can see the name of the physics function that's taking up the most time. That's great. Um, Google it. Go on Unity the Answers. Go on the forum. Like, give that information. and somebody will have had the same problem as you. Frequently, if it is a Unity system like rendering or physics, chances are you're trying to do too much or you're trying to do something too often. Somebody else will have bumped into this. And we said at the start, don't just copy other people's solutions. But if they've got the same problem, that's exactly when you should copy their solutions and try that out. If the problem relates to code that you've written, um, which we'll cover a couple of examples of in a minute, obviously you can't Google that. You can't be like, why is my script.cs running slowly? Because you wrote it and nobody else did. So this is where you need to build a bit more knowledge on your own in order to dig into what it is about your code that is running slowly. 
Right now, we're going to walk you through a couple of examples of ways that your code could be leading to these kind of problems with some ideas for getting started on how to fix that. So we're going to talk about some common performance problems, and it's actually two common performance problems. Uh, the first is slow scripts, right? So this is simple to explain. It happens when scripts that we write create too much work for the CPU to achieve during our frame. So in the profiler, if you verified that you are, in fact, CPU bound, and you see high usage in the category scripts, which you can view individually, this indicates that user scripts or your scripts are contributing to the problem. So the bottom half of the profiler will indicate what functions are actually the most costly in terms of time, and we can examine them and decide what to do from here. Another option at this stage is what's called deep profiling. So you can enable deep profiling in the editor. And this can only be done in the editor, but it, what it will allow you to do is to delve more deeply into your scripts and see which specific operations are taking the most time. It's worth, it's worth noting that this will incur some overhead in the editor, so you'll see an overall performance drop. But this allows you to get a proportional idea of oh, this line or these two lines or these operations are really taking a lot more time than everything else, and this is kind of where we need to drill in. So how can we write code that runs faster? One of the first things that we can do, our code may simply be inefficient, right? So we should examine any expensive functions that we're calling to make sure that we're not simply doing more work than we need to, right? Examples of this could be performing a calculation inside a loop that could be called outside of that loop, right? Calling the same function repeatedly when we could do it once and cache the result. Uh, or, for example, updating a GUI element every frame when we could update it only when the value changes. Another possibility is that the code is well structured in and of itself, but makes un unnecessarily expensive calls to other code. So calling an ex expensive Unity API function, for example, some Unity API calls are more costly than others, right? You'll kind of get, grow this body of knowledge as you work with Unity more. They might be, some piece of code might be fine for prototyping, but may cause problems as our game scales up, right? So an example of this might be send message. Others may be moderately costly, so they might be totally fine to use one called from start, but if you're calling, in an, calling it in update and calling it every frame, uh, that may be an unacceptable cost. So an example of this might be find, right? If you're finding an object or finding a component, Especially as you get to have lots of objects in your scene, right? It's going to have to loop over the whole scene, and it can take a long time. Um, there's no list. It, this is an important idea. There's no list of functions you should never use, right? This is a case-by-case -case decision that you have to make to say, you know what? I want to spend part of my frame at this stage because I feel like this is a really important operation, and this is the way that I want to do it. That is your decision to make as long as you know I can fit that in and still hit my target frame rate consistently, right? I feel like that, more than just working from received knowledge, hopefully will empower you to make those kind of decisions in a more educated way. So the, another possibility is that our code is efficient, but it's being called when it doesn't need to be. For example, we have an enemy all the way on one side of the map, and it's raycasting every frame to look for the player. The player's way over here. We could either completely turn that off, right? The best code is code that's never run, right? Or the most efficient code is code that's never run. Or maybe we could dial the frequency down and do it 10 times a second as opposed to 60 times a second. Um, you know, a final possibility is code that's simply too demanding. So it's not a bottleneck, but it's a problem of scale, right? So let's say, taking that ray casting example, maybe the player is doing a bunch of ray casts every frame, and that's fine because there's one instance of the player, but then we have 100 enemies in the scene, and they may not be able to do those same, you know, costly calculations. So, you know, kind of key points, fix inefficient code. Beware of, in, beware of expensive function calls. Don't run code more frequently than it needs to, and obviously do less when possible. 
Okay, another performance problem that can be caused by the code we write in our scripts is excessive garbage collection. Um, garbage collection is one of those subjects that comes up quite a lot. People have got a lot of questions about it. It can seem kind of intimidating. It's, it is a complex subject, but you don't need a very complex understanding of it to get going with fixing it. So um, garbage collection is part of how Unity manages memory. To very briefly summarize, when it comes to the code that we write in our scripts, Unity has two pools of memory. They are called the stack and the heap. When we create a variable in a script, Unity requests a block of memory from one of those pools. As long as the variable's in scope, that memory remains in use. We say that memory has been allocated. When the variable goes out of scope, the memory is no longer needed, and it can be returned to the pool it came from. Stack memory goes straight back in the pool for reuse. That's really simple and quick. Heap memory becomes something called garbage. That's the term for memory that's no longer in use, but hasn't been put back in its pool yet. Garbage is only returned to the pool when a piece of code called the garbage collector runs. So garbage collection is an essential cleanup operation for recycling heap memory. It's not a problem that it happens. It needs to happen. But it can be a problem if our code makes it run too often or if we give it too much work to do when it runs. Um, the intricacies of when garbage collection runs and some of the side effects are a bit too detailed for this talk. The main thing you need to know is this, in the vast majority of cases, the best way to reduce the impact of garbage collection on your game is to reduce the number of heap allocations overall and to avoid making heap allocations at performance sensitive times. How to recognize when you've got a garbage collection problem? Um, one indication, you'll play your game and you'll notice it mainly seems to run fine, but it'll occasionally stutter or freeze. That's a clue that you've got a garbage collection problem. When you look in the profiler, um, you'll see in the top, in the CPU usage profiler in the graph there, a big part of the graph will be taken up with um, something called garbage collection. That's what it'll show you as a color-coded section. And then in the hierarchy view at the bottom, there's a function called GC collect. If you see that taking up a lot of your CPU time, that indicates that's garbage collection taking too long or running at an inconvenient time. So garbage is heap memory that's not being used anymore. So finding out which functions are requesting heap memory is how we track down where this garbage is coming from. With the CPU profiler selected, um, we can use the hierarchy view at the bottom to see which functions are allocating heap memory using a column called GC alloc. You can sort by that and see exactly which functions are, are making these heap allocations to track this down. So we're aiming to reduce the number of heap allocations overall and to avoid making them at performance sensitive times. So I mentioned that there are two pools of memory, the stack and the heap, and the stack is quick and cheap. So if we can make stack allocations instead of heap ones, we should. Things that go on the stack are local value typed variables. Um, so if we can use one of those in place of anything else, it will just be a stack allocation. Um, a really easy example of this is strings. In C Sharp, strings are reference variables, so they go on the heap. If you've got some code in update that's building a complex string, say for a GUI label or your player's health display, and it's joining a load of strings together, you're creating garbage in every frame. If you use a string builder instead of joining a load of strings, that's um, a value typed variable that will go on the stack instead of the heap. You won't generate nearly as much garbage. Often it's tiny examples like that that add up throughout your whole UI and then further throughout your whole project. You can't always use the stack instead of the heap. You, you have to make heap allocations. Um, but if your code has to create heap allocations, if you can't reduce the number, you should treat garbage generating code as though it were expensive code. So all of those tips from Matt's last section about what to do with expensive code, 
do that with your code that causes heap allocations. Um, consider moving that code from update to start, for example, or make that code run once per second instead of once per frame. There's plenty more you can do to improve this problem if you have a garbage collection problem. It is a deep subject, but this will help the vast majority of cases to, to simply reduce the overall number of heap allocations. So, sort of in conclusion, I know that we said that there aren't any rules, right, but we're going to tell you some anyway. We have this kind of profile, analyze, change, repeat loop that we're, we'd like you to walk away with and to think about. Profiling your game in worst conditions, right, in, worst case, in a worst case scenario, meaning on probably the lowest spec device that you want to support, right? If you're targeting a mobile game, you might want to have an older, less powerful mobile device to make sure if you're going to support that device that your game actually can run on it uh, under the conditions that you expect. And then lastly, don't worry about this stuff unless you actually need to, right? Don't worry about problems that are not problems for your game, right? So we've all maybe heard the phrase premature optimization is the root of all evil, right? So if this is not a problem in your game on your target device, it's not a problem, right? You may be doing expensive operations that you can afford, right? And somebody may be saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're doing that in some forum on the internet, right? And actually, if it's not a problem for you, it's not actually a problem. If you've enjoyed this talk and want to learn more about this subject, um, still in a fairly beginner-friendly way, um, please do check out the performance optimization section of the Unity Learn site. Um, there are a bunch of tutorials there uh, that I wrote um, that go into this subject in more depth, um, including a lot of examples, um, how to track down specific gnarly problems, suggested solutions, particularly um, the rendering one, we didn't go into any rendering optimizations for time reasons today, but um, that's got a lot of uh, granular detail in there. And yeah, they're great, those articles. Carrie Min is not allowed to say it, but I'll say that they're <laughs> really informative and worth a read. Thank you. And uh, th thank you all as well.